Well, as you know, this week we celebrate the 4th of July, Independence Day, 1776, the day our nation declared its freedom from the colonial rule of England. No taxation without representation. Give me liberty or give me death, all of that. One of the most capable military leaders in the Revolutionary War <clears throat> was a man whose name was Benedict Arnold. He put his life on the line to gain freedom for the colonies. He, early in the war, he captured Fort Ticonderoga. And with his passion for America and his leadership skills, he quickly rose through the ranks of the Continental Army under George Washington. He was even disabled in the pivotal Battle of Saratoga. Benedict Arnold was an American hero. But he's not remembered for that, is he? He's remembered for turning his back on the country and putting himself under British rule again. You see, Benedict Arnold felt that he didn't get the respect he reserved, he deserved from the other American leaders. And he struggled with debt and with a new bride who was sympathetic with the king. And he believed that America was going to lose the war. So in 1780, when George Washington put Benedict Arnold in charge of the crucial new fort at West Point, Arnold secretly struck a deal to turn the fort over to the British in exchange for 20,000 pounds sterling and a position of brigadier general in the British Army. These plans were discovered, though, and Arnold fled to the British, and his name has become synonymous with a traitor. After years of fighting for freedom from British tyranny, he went right back to it to make a few bucks and to get the recognition that he thought he deserved. It doesn't sound like a very good trade, does it? Exchange freedom for a little money, liberty for a job title. I mean, who would make such a trade? Actually, a lot of us. That's why in Galatians 5, 1, Paul writes, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. There's always the temptation to go back to old ways of thinking and living. God has declared us his children, but we go back to living as if we were orphans. Jesus has paid the price for our sins, and yet we go back to trying to earn our salvation by being good enough. The Holy Spirit has delivered us from bondage of addictions to money or, or alcohol or drugs or sex or food or gambling, even attention or anger, jealousy, and a host of, of other old habits that controlled our lives. But the temptation is there to go back to slavery, to give up our freedom in Christ and to let those things take control again. Like Benedict Arnold, we're quick to exchange our freedom for a little bit of something else that's so less valuable. And sometimes we don't even realize it. We may deny that, that these things make us slaves, but, but they're no less controlling. In John chapter 8, Jesus has a conversation with some Jewish believers. Now, these are believers in Jesus. They believe in Jesus. They just don't believe that they need the freedom that he gives because in their minds, they've always been free. It reminds me of the teen that, that questioned me once after worship. We had used a, a prayer of confession in the service, and, and it was something like, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart, and we've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. I don't do any of that, he said. So why should I pray it? Confession is for other people, he argued. 
So sin is what other people do, not him. Well, listen to Jesus' encounter with these Jewish believers who thought freedom is what other people needed, not them. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus tells them that if they hold on to his teaching, they'll discover the truth, and the truth will set them free. But they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? We are Abraham's descendants, and we've never been slaves of anyone? Have they forgotten their history? What about the 400 years of slavery in Egypt? What about the 70 years of captivity in Babylon? And even now, they're under control of the Romans. And any Roman can say to them, carry my stuff. And they were obligated to carry it for a mile. How can they say that they've never been under slavery? Jesus says, you are slaves. You are slaves to sin. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Sin can make slaves of all of us. Just as we talked about. And as Jesus has said, he sets us free. Now you don't have to raise your hand, but how many here have been set free from something by Jesus? Maybe set free from some hatred. Maybe set free from always trying to be good enough. Set free from thinking that no one cares. Set free from trying to be your own God. Free from addiction, free from anger, maybe even free from anxiety. I bet there are more stories here than there are people of how Jesus has set them free. But I also bet there are more stories than people here because like me, at some point, you've gone back. Back to slavery. Took up the yoke of slavery again. When the Jews were freed from slavery that first time from Egypt, it didn't take very long before they wanted to go back, just like we often want to go back. Remember that talk about manna a few weeks ago, that bread from heaven that God provided for them? They were there in the wilderness, and there was was no food around, but God provided their daily bread, all that they needed. And they were free They had enough to eat and drink. There was a pillar of cloud to guide them by day and a pillar of fire to protect them each night. God was with them. But before long, they started thinking about going back to slavery. And why? Because they got bored with what they had to eat. This is what Numbers says about that and their complaint. These are the Israelites complaining there in the desert. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. And that's how it works, doesn't it? I mean, no one says, I want to be a slave again. No one says, I want to give up my freedom Benedict Arnold didn't say, I want to live under tyranny again. No, he said, I want a little more money. I want a little more prestige. So he went back. Just like people today. No one says, I want to be addicted again. No one says, I want to be consumed with hatred again. No one one says, I want to treat others in an unchristian manner or I want to ruin their lives again. No, it's usually something much smaller. I just want to have a little fun. I just want a little payback. I just want what I want. 
And we're tempted to trade our freedoms for it. That's what happened to the Israelites. Imagine you've just escaped from 400 years of slavery, and in no time you're willing to trade your freedom for some fish and vegetables, leeks and onions and garlics. I mean, would anyone make that trade? But we do. All this summer we were looking at lessons from the foods in the Bible, and today we're going to make one of the oldest recipes that has ever been discovered. It comes from some clay tablets uh, in Yale's Babylonian collection, and they date to around 1730 B.C., so almost 4,000 years ago, which means this recipe was floating around the Middle East when the Israelites were still slaves. Perhaps it was one of these foods like this that they were dreaming of when they wanted to go back to slavery rather than have their bread from heaven. And this recipe is titled Unwinding Stew. Now actually, this recipe has very few instructions. It's, it's almost just an ingredient list. Um, you can see the ingredients in your bulletin. You've got the recipe there. Because the average cook didn't stand around with some big clay tablet uh, book trying to cook. You know, like they're the Flintstones or something, you know. It's, it doesn't work that way. Um, they didn't have Apple tablets. They had huge tablets of clay that they would, would press a little stick into to write the recipe down. And the recipe, they probably didn't even read it because most couldn't read it. They were probably taught the recipe and they remembered it and they made it. But for some reason, at some point, almost 4,000 years ago, somebody wrote it down in a clay tablet and it's still preserved to this day. Unwinding stew. You know, now a couple of things to remember about it. Um, in addition to the fact that they weren't following a cookbook, uh, also some of the things listed in the recipe, we're not exactly sure what they are or we don't have those exact things in our stores. It's kind of like 4,000 years from now and somebody finds a recipe for Rice Krispie bars. <laughs> you know, would they know what Rice Krispies are? And would they still have them? in the stores. So this is our best effort to duplicate this recipe for unwinding stew. A stew that was, goes back even further than the time of Moses and the Israelites in the desert. So let's make it now. This stew has some garlic in it, and uh, it's doing a number on me here. All right. Well, first off, it specifically states that meat is not used in this recipe. Uh, it's not exactly vegetarian because they, they do use a little bit of fat to saute. Um, but if you do want to make it vegetarian, you can just saute in olive oil rather than uh, some other kind of fat. Um, and you have a nice vegetarian stew. Now, you begin with a loaf of sourdough bread. And if you just cut it into slices, and then tear the bread slices into little chunks. I'm going to put them in here. We'll get them ready. And we'll have them ready when the, the stew is done. Obviously, I will not be uh, cooking here. I don't have a, a hot plate, and we don't have the 20 minutes it takes for this to cook. So, but you crumble up your bread, uh, and, and then actually, if you mush it up really good, that'll get there. All right. So the main ingredient is leeks. If you're not familiar with leeks, um, 
They look like sort of giant green onions, and they have a mild onion flavor. Um, they're actually very good. You don't use so much of these, the top part, a lot of dirt in here, but uh, um, you just slice your leeks thinly. And it takes two leeks, but I'm only cutting up one. Put it in your pot, put in a clove of garlic, and a little bit of olive oil, and then you saute this for three or four minutes. Then add some cilantro. I know people are kind of hit or miss on cilantro, but uh, add a half a bunch of cilantro, another minute or two, and then you add your liquid. Uh, probably just water back then, uh, but if you want a little more flavor, not quite so authentic, but um, just a, a quart of this vegetable broth. And uh, so you just put it in there. You let that uh, simmer for 20 minutes. When it's all done, then you go to your, your bread. Now, we don't know why this was called unwinding stew. It could be because it's a relaxing meal. You know, stew kind of helps you relax and unwind. But it could also be what you do with this bread. So you, you smash your bread into handfuls, and then you drop it in the pot. And it kind of unwinds um, as it goes in there. And then you serve it immediately with the remainder of your bread. Oops. Salt it to taste. So, however, however much you want. And there you go. Now, you are not going to get a sample of this. Because <laughs> it's not cooked. Um, so that's it. It's very simple. Uses some of the, the leeks, the garlic. If you wanted to throw some onions in there, you'd have all those three things they mentioned uh, that was available back at, in slavery. Let me take this off. And even if you served it with the other things that they talked about there, the melons, the cucumbers, and the fish, this still is not that memorable meal. I mean, if I were to grade the, uh, the stew, I would say it's about a B. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, <laughs> But, but this is not the kind of thing that any rational person would want to go back to slavery to eat. And yet, that's what the Israelites were saying. They want to go back when it's such a poor trade. And we do some of the same things, don't we? In the New Testament, Paul finds Christians who have been saved by grace through faith, but who then want to go back to a form of religion based on following the Jewish laws of circumcision. Like so many of us, they want to rely on their own goodness and they're following the religious laws and on rituals to save them. Paul says, that's, that's like going back to slavery. Either Christ's work is enough to save us or it isn't. Stick with the truth of Christ, he says. Don't go back to the old ways, he tells them. I'm going to read from Galatians 5 again, this time in a different translation. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again, if you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off from Christ. You've fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised, or being uncircumcised, what is important is faith expressing itself in love. You are running the race so well. Who held you back from following the truth? 
It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who calls you to freedom. God has called you and me to freedom. Freedom from the sins that ensnare us. Freedom from the lies that tempt us to go back to old ways of living and thinking. The kind of lies where we tell ourselves, oh, I guess it wasn't so bad back in slavery where we had leeks and onions and garlic. At least we had unwinding stew. Don't be like that. Don't be like the Galatians. Don't be like Benedict Arnold. Don't trade your freedom in Christ for anything. It's a terrible deal. All right, well, next week we're going to make one of the other things that, that the Israelites uh, were longing for, fish. Particularly, we're going to make the kind of fish that the disciples caught in the Sea of Galilee. But for today, let's just end in prayer, giving thanks for the blessing of the freedom that we have in Christ. Oh, Lord, this week our nation celebrates its independence and its freedom. But Lord, that pales in comparison to the freedom that you give us, each one of us, through your Holy Spirit, through your grace, through faith in you. Thank you, Jesus, for the freedom that you give us and help us to hold that as the precious treasure it is. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd invite you to stand. Thank you.